Hello, welcome to the Flute 360 podcast, where we incorporate a panoramic view of flute-related topics. I am your host, Heidi K. Begay, and this is episode 44, Competition Repertoire Guides with Jake Fritkiss. Before we get into today's show, I would like to share with you a wonderful flute company. Founded in Boston, Massachusetts in 1888, the William S. Haynes Company creates bespoke professional concert flutes and head joints for flutists around the world. These sought-after instruments are prized for the rich and colorful timbre that only a Haynes instrument can offer. The master flute makers at the William S. Haynes Company are constantly listening to the current needs of flutists, so they can craft an instrument that meets today's requirements. Their dedication to the Boston tradition of flute making and meeting the demands of a modern flutist is carried through every instrument which bears the Haynes monogram. Follow them at Haynes Flutes on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Welcome everyone to another episode of Flute 360 Podcast. Today I am with the Jake Fritkiss, who is the principal flutist of the Fort Worth Symphony Orchestra. Welcome, Jake, and thank you for your time and your energy into this episode. I can't wait to pick your brain. Well, happy to do it. Great. So for the listeners, just so you know where we're coming from and what we're going to talk about today, we are discussing specific repertoire pieces that are requirements for the NFA and for TFS. So we are specifically looking at NFA's convention competition and we are looking at NFA's Professional Flute Choir Competition Repertoire. In addition, we are looking at the Texas Flute Society's Myrna Brown Competition, and I can't wait to see how Jake would approach these pieces, and we're gonna talk about form and um, how he would practice this, but more importantly, maybe let's first, Jake, talk about the general just competition guidelines of how uh, your where your mindset um, can be or should be when going into a competition and preparing for such an event? Well, I think, you know, there's a couple different things to remember when you're preparing for any kind of competition, you know, audition, competition, recital, even really the only criteria is what's on the page. So if we have rules, you know, and you want to look at it like you know, you're taking a math test, right? Then you have to follow the, those specific rules. So if, if we have articulation and note values and rhythm and dynamics, those are really your, your ground rules. So you have to try your best to really get all of those things in there. So when I'm looking at a piece, if I was doing a competition, the first thing I would be focused on is how can I get all this stuff on the page into my performance? So that would be you know, a big chunk of my practicing is how it, can I be as exact as possible? And I think a lot of the times when we do competitions, we remember to be exact with the notes. We forget to be exact with the dynamics because you're just trying so hard to get through these pieces. Sometimes they're really hard. And uh, we forget that a really nice phrase and uh, following the dynamics uh, can really help. And with these pieces, I mean, besides the Telemann, everything is pretty much marked for you. You don't really have to be a musical genius to figure out where these phrases are going. There's a lot of editorial notes. So if you really just follow what's on the page, you can actually come out with a really nice version of all these pieces. So that's where I would start if I was preparing for the competition. As far as general competition mindset goes, I think if you go into any competition trying to improve your flute playing as your first goal, uh, you can't lose because... At the end of the day, if you get better at flute and you don't win, then you still won because the next time you'll be even better. And, you know, when you give a recital or go on to have a career, that stuff helps. So I think trying to look at it as not how can I cram in all this practice time and get this piece to be, you know, quote unquote, perfect. Uh, look, think about what can you work on in your flute playing through these pieces and how can you become a really fantastic flute player by learning these pieces. Um, and then I think you'll also have a much better time preparing because you'll be in a more creative mindset and uh, be problem solving instead of just panicking, trying to play a bunch of notes. I agree. 
And then you have that mindset of, like you said, just improving your flute skills rather than thinking, oh, I have to win this competition. Because if you have that mindset, you have to win, then it goes to what you said of this panicky. And yeah. that's no fun. Well, and I always tell my students, you don't have control over the outcome. So don't try to control it. If you go into a competition thinking, I can make myself win by doing this, this, and this, you might do those things and lose. Right. And then maybe you were controlling the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. So if you instead just come up with an idea of how you want to play the flute and how you want to play the piece and you do that, then you learned how to be an artist and how to you know express yourself. And if the judges don't pick you, then they didn't pick you. But it's not, you know, I would much rather come up with my own version of how I want to play the piece and really develop, you know, as a musician than try to check all the boxes that I think I need to check in order to win something. Uh, because then, then when you get to the end of that competition, if you don't win, then you got nothing out of it other than, you know, doing what you thought was maybe the right answer in that situation. And the more you can look at it from a self-improvement side, then the, the better of an experience it'll be. And I, I try to look at everything like that. When, when I, we have an orchestra program, I try to figure out what I can improve about my playing every week so I can always get better. Nice. Yeah. Perfect. I really appreciate that. And I love that. Would you like to now dive into the Telemann? Sure. Yeah. Let's start with Telemann. Okay. So this is the A major fantasy and there are two main movements and yeah, I will have you take it away, Jake, and tell us your thoughts about. So, you know, I think for Telemann, you're the show. So you don't want to be too straightforward. I think, I think right in the beginning, we have kind of a you know, pedal tone A that takes the listener's ear. So it's kind of like a Bach cello suite or, you know, maybe like the CB Bach A minor um, mm -hmm. where you have this kind of resonant note and then there's stuff around it going on. So I play these pretty free. I think for a competition, you know, you're going to want to play them with the correct rhythmic value, but that doesn't mean that there can't be rubato. Mm -hmm. So uh, rubato, when done correctly, is taking time and giving time. So the time has to equal out in the end. So, you know, maybe you speed up a little bit and then you slow down a little bit. But that's how I would approach this opening. You don't want to be too boring, even though that's a terrible word. <laughs> I think if you want to make an impression, uh, you have to do something. So for me, playing a solo flute piece is really fun because you're the whole show. And I think it can be really freeing. And I remember when I was younger, it was the opposite. It was it was like terrifying because you have nothing to hide behind. So hmm. if you look at it as an opportunity to show what you can do instead of, um, uh Oh, like now if I chip a note, everybody's going to hear, hmm. then, then you could have a better time with something like this. And, uh, you know, there's a billion recordings of these pieces yes. and a lot of really good ones. And I don't think that there's really a right or wrong way to go about the Fantasias. Um, I would say that you want to, you know, focus on making a good sound, you know, a clean sound on every note. You probably don't want to be using super fast vibrato all the time because that's maybe not stylistically as correct or what would be considered stylistically correct for something like this. But I would say use vibrato, you know, they, yeah. they did back then also, even though... Yeah. We don't, it's a little different we don't allow that yeah, uh, anymore. Um, right. But, you know, they, they use vibrato that all my experiences working with early music people, they're pretty wild. Like they, they like things to be on the edge. Mm -hmm. A lot of these people were improvisers and multi-instrument players. And, you know, they, they weren't, it wasn't the same kind of holy reverence that we seem to approach Baroque music with now. So I would, I wouldn't be scared to have fun with it and, uh, and kind of let loose a little bit, especially since it's a solo piece and it should really, um, you know, give the impression of you can do whatever you want on the flute and you're making it up on the spot. And, you know, here's, here's this amazing piece that we're kind of getting into. Um, for sure. Yeah. And these fantasies, when you said that being more free, what triggered with me was just the form of a fantasy. It's similar in the sense of like the very famous Baroque suite, 
but it has more of a free form than a Baroque suite. And so just knowing that about the genre kind of gives you that permission to be free. And every performance, like you said, there are a million different recordings out there between Jasmine Choi and Jean-Pierre Rampal, Galway. Pahu just released all of them. Pahu just released one, yes. And then Amy Porter has a DVD out there where she explains all 12. And they're all so different. And that just showcases uh, what the genre is about and just the performance style of the Baroque period. I mean, Talman did not write in articulation markings everywhere. I mean, he has a couple, but the year text, the version that we're looking at, the Baron writer, it was up to the performer's discretion to write in ornamentations to do a notch log here or a mordant or a trill here or there and whether to slur a group of notes, yes or no. You know, and so Mm -hmm. that's where the variety comes into these pieces. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, we have, so we have kind of like a rhapsodic opening, you know, right? So it's yeah. any, anything goes. And then we get to the fugue and then, you know, we have this kind of harmonic rhythm kick in, mm-hmm. which I think as a one line instrument, it's easy to miss. And we have this in all the solo flute music, you know, the Bach partita, same thing. There's a lot, you know, where we can really bring out the bass mm-hmm. to kind of show where the harmony is going. You know, so when we have this, you know, like in the pickup to measure 13, you have it circled in your part. Uh, the three notes, they lead into the downbeat. And then uh, I would say uh, in measure 15, the last three notes, they lead into the next downbeat. Uh, so we can bring out these little moves, you know, maybe they would be a bass line or, you know, maybe that would the organ, the, the feet would play it, uh, you know, mm-hmm. so th- we can find these little spots to make it sound like two voices or three voices or four voices or however many voices you hear in your head. And just kind of make it more multi-dimensional than just a one flute line. So I, that's what I love about playing Baroque music. I like to play, I love playing all the Fantasias and a lot of solo Baroque stuff. And I think it's actually an amazing opportunity to be creative, mm-hmm. not, you know, not locked into maybe as much of the fear of breaking a rule as look at what's here on this page and how can I, unlock, you know, the key to what the composer was after. And um, I think if you look at it that way and try to find these these little moves, you know, that maybe you'll hear in the Bach cello suites or something like that, try to copy them from other pieces. Uh, you try to find that stuff in here and then put it into your own playing. Uh, I think it can be a really, really fun experience to dive into these pieces. Definitely. And I think also these pieces ask us in a way, like any repertoire, just us honoring and knowing that specific time period. So it kind of gives us an opportunity to maybe check out resources like Quance's On Playing the Flute and checking out that treatise. And they talk about ornamentation and articulation, what the Baroque performers were doing during that time period. Another resource that I checked out to get ready for today's talk was Robert Donington's A Performer's Guide to Baroque Music. He talks about articulation and tone and things like that. I think that's a great guide to use. It doesn't have to be like the Bible and you have to, you know, stick to it through and through, but it's good to have those guides with us to kind of navigate and help us along that creative path. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I mean, I think the more information you have, the better. Mm -hmm. The most important information is in the music. Mm -hmm. So, you know, knowing the harmonies, knowing how these things work, knowing the style, having listened to a lot of this kind of music, having listened to a lot of classical music that, you know, developed off of this, that can, that sometimes seems to be the missing piece to me, uh, where with a lot of young flute players, they might actually know what the rules are. Maybe their teachers told them what the rules are and, but they don't understand the music Mm -hmm. at all, or, you know, haven't listened to the, you know, Brandenburg concertos or, you know, other Telemann pieces or, you know, all, all, we have so much music from this time period. And uh, so I think any piece that you're playing, try to immerse yourself in the style and, and kind of get a feel for that, you know, with your ears also. I remember uh, when I was at Yale, Jed Wentz came in and did a class. And uh, uh, for those of you who don't know, he's, you know, one of the top Baroque flute players in the world and just amazing. And I remember the whole time he was trying to get everybody to come out of the show. Like every single person played, you know, we all played, you know, Bach for him and 
And every single person, he was just like, no, you need to do more. You need to do more. You need to do more. And this guy knows like every, you know, detail about the style of how to play this. And that's what he does for his life. And I think a lot of the times when you learn these things, you know, academically what to do, then sometimes, you know, you forget that it still has to sound like music. So, yeah. so it's, it's like this balance of mm. get all the information you possibly can. Absolutely. Like you should always be the most informed about any piece of music you're playing really in any style, but then also try to make it exciting and sound good and, you know, all yeah. of those fun things. So yeah. That, and that's been my experience with all the early music people I've worked with. With Jed was like the first one. And then Nicholas McGeegan, I forget which orchestra he conducts in England, but it's one of the big Baroque orchestras and he's been there for 35 years. He's like one of the foremost, you know, scholars on Baroque music and early classical. And he actually was a flute player. He was the principal flutist, I think, in Roger Norrington's orchestra in England. And uh, he conducts us in the Clyburn and we did all the Mozart concertos. And I've also worked with him quite a bit at Aspen and same thing every time. It's like more, more, you know, forte, more, you know, piano less, you know, like, and he wants everything to really come to life. And, mm -hmm. I, and so I think there's this spirit behind this music that actually is kind of raucous, you know, or a little bit out there, yeah. especially, you know, and you know, especially solo music, if you play 10 minutes of solo flute around the same dynamic, I'm a flute player and I'm bored, you know? Yes. So, uh, yeah. so we really have to make it come to life and, you know, use these, you know, I think understanding the form, understanding the, I guess, rules, but then, then using them to enhance the performance instead of using them as a, you know, something to make us scared to play out. Yes, yeah. I agree. And it, it sounds a lot like my experience with my Baroque Traverso teacher. His name is Kim Pineda. Hmm. And I took a semester Traverso class with him hmm. at Texas Tech. And it was a great experience. Like, I love Dr. Pineda, and I hope he's listening to this episode because he's out there, and he's the first one to admit that. Yeah. Like, he's witty and quirky, and I love that about him. And every class was, I hope I'm not misinterpreting this, but it was always be cheesier, you know, even more, you know. Yeah. And then one of my classmates, Spencer, he'd be over the top cheesy, and he's like, oh, okay, maybe that's a little too much. But we would just laugh because he, there was never enough for him in the sense that there were so many different possibilities. Yeah. It didn't sound like he never came into class and said, the Barokians never do this. I mean, he's never said yeah, yeah. that. And it was, it was an open book. And like, what are the possibilities? And let's figure out how to experiment with this. And I felt set free or let loose in a way. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of had, I had a different mindset going into that class thinking, Absolutely. oh, he's going to make me stick to X, Y, and Z. And it was the complete, complete opposite. opposite. Yeah. yeah. I've always found that with those, those kind of people, it's like, they know the most about it, but they don't use it in a way to constrain themselves. You know, they might say, oh, well, that's not really done. Like, and, and there might be certain things that, you know, maybe you yeah. don't want to do with note lengths and, you know, some accenting and stuff like that but really for the most part uh actually jed told us they used to do this like finger vibrato on traverse yes. where like they they literally put down a key that's you know doesn't go down it's kind of like sounds like a new music effect <laughs> and you know it's like that was a that was a thing back then and they shake they literally yeah, shook liter it over the literally yep. shakes the note and it that was their vibrato bizarre but uh <laughs> that was you know one of the types of vibrato that they could do and they would use so yeah i, I think you know don't be scared to if you're playing this for a competition, we are playing on modern instruments. You know, we are, it, it is for a modern flute competition and, uh, you know, I wouldn't be scared to, you know, play it out a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And to kind of summarize the Telemann, since Jake and I have been talking about Traverso flute, there are a lot of Traverso flutes out there that you can buy inexpensive. And I don't know if Jake agrees with this, but after having that class of holding a traversal flute and hearing what it sounds like and feeling the timbres and just the hollowness of that flute, I was able to experience these Telemann pieces on a different level. So if there are listeners out there that can get their hands on a traversal flute, like maybe borrow your teachers or buy one that's inexpensive or even get your hand on a plastic recorder. I don't know. I just feeling the instrument, you can maybe find the parallels of that instrument and maybe bring it over to the modern instrument. 
Sure. And I've never tried a traverse flute, honestly. Yeah. It was hard enough for me to play the real flute. So. <laughs> the cross fingerings are a little funky. Yeah, I was um. like, this is always just trying to, you know, do yeah. long tones. <laughs> but no, I think, yeah, I'm sure it could definitely help. And uh, why not? To, if yeah. you, especially in school when they're there, what, you might as well try. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So if there's not anything else you would like to say about the Telemann, we can move on to the Prelude Eight Scherzo by Bousset. And... This piece is for the NFA Professional Flute Choir Competition. It's one of the pieces. And this is such a staple 19th century French flute conservatory piece, right? I mean, it has that very standard introduction, and then it goes into that scherzo very lively yeah. and jokingly, which a lot of these conservatory pieces are. They have these two movements, two contrasting movements. So... Feel free, Jake, to dive into what you would like to say about this particular piece. Well, I mean, I love all of the French conservatory pieces. I think they're just, you know, some of the greatest music that we have. I think that for this piece, you know, one of the challenges is right in the beginning, you know, we start soft, right? And we start solo. There's no piano for the first three bars. There's going to be a temptation to maybe play too loud right in the beginning, maybe also a temptation to play too soft, you know, so we have to figure out what, what is our dynamic? I think, you know, with the French stuff in America, we kind of misinterpret it. I think that the French school has gotten slightly warped by American ears. So with, especially with, with vibrato, um, okay. you know, the vibrato that we tend to use in America is like maybe too wide for French piece like this. Okay. And then the other thing that happens is then everybody plays non vibrato as a, you know, kind of alternative to that. So it's either a very wide kind of floppy vibrato or a non completely gone. And I think that's because we hear the French flute players as sounding like they don't use a lot of vibrato. You know, mm -hmm. when you listen to Pahoud or Baudemont or Dufour, you know, it, it sounds like there's not a lot of vibrato, you know, mm. in, in the recordings. But if you listen really closely, the, the vibrato is just very ingrained in the sound. So, so they have a very thick core and then, you know, maybe a, a narrower vibrato uh, that doesn't go quite as far outside of the sound. So that that's actually, I think, a big key for this opening and having, you know, some kind of mystery in the very beginning is don't let the vibrato control your sound, you know, mm. have have vibrato within your sound. So it's kind of, uh, you know, part of your sound, even though everybody says that it's, it's very true. Uh, you know, if you can kind of keep the idea of just a core and the vibrato doesn't shake the core too much, that's how I would start this. And then right from the beginning, you know, we have this big crescendo. It's pretty self-explanatory. We are, it's kind of a typical French type mm. of fantasy opening you know be flexible with with your dynamics what you have here is very clear on the page so you should do it you know don't play too loud in the pianos don't play too loud in the mezzo forte you know make sure that the forte you know three bars later is more mm. and uh always have that kind of uh perspective of playing the long game instead of uh you know just note to note oh there's a crescendo that means i get loud yeah. um and, you know, I, I find that a lot with these pieces because there's a lot of crescendo, diminuendo, you know, hairpin kind of things. And uh, we tend to come out of the dynamic. So, you know, it'll be piano, crescendo, diminuendo, and the middle of that is a forte. And mm. that's not correct. The middle of that should be a mezzo piano, you know, unless mm. it's marked differently. Like, you know, here's one to mezzo forte later on. You know, always stay within the realm of the dynamic that you're playing in. And then that actually makes what you're doing more effective because then you can see the long form of the piece instead of, you know, it, otherwise it starts to get too jumpy because these pieces are really well notated. You know, right. there's so much information. But if we overdo that information, it's almost as bad as not doing it at all because then you, you know, you start to lose any kind of flow. Mm. And French music is really about the flow. You know, if you if you listen to like Ravel or Debussy, it's like sometimes just this amazing wash of colors and sounds and you just have no idea where it's going and, and then it becomes something really amazing. And uh, the same thing with this kind of piece is don't 
you know, when you start the the six four, you know, the melody, don't blow it all on the first note. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it still has to go somewhere. So we always have to have this big picture in mind and um, pacing. You know, we ha- he has the, the metronome markings and I, I think they're, yeah. you know, kind of fast, you know, as mm-hmm. a lot of French slow movements are, they're actually pretty fast, you mm. know, and you should play them that way because that's yeah. how they would have played them. Uh, mm. You know, actually like Afternoon of a Fawn has a, re- Debussy like at some, somewhere had written a metronome marking and it was like insanely fast. It's basically uh, in in the big beats. It's not in uh, the beats. eighth notes. Sure. And I mean, nobody does it at that tempo because it actually doesn't sound very good. But like, <laughs> uh, but the French style generally, the the metronome click is quite fast in the slow music and okay. and that's that's how it was meant to be played mm. and i remember when I, I was playing for a really famous french conductor just everything that i played for him he just wanted faster you know oh. it's just uh, n- not not the fast stuff the fast stuff was fine it was the slow stuff mm-hmm. they want to hear the momentum of the music and they want to hear where it's going they're sure. not so interested in like sitting on a note and savoring that note all the time it's it's like well here's a big picture let's hear the next you know where is this going uh, sure you know, so that I think, you know, for any like we were talking about with the Telmon, learn the style, learn the genre, um, listen to other French music from around this time. You know, mm-hmm. listen to a lot of Ravel, not just Daphnis, and you know, listen to Debussy, and um, try to understand what was going on in France. You know, yeah. not not just oh, what how can I play this on on the flute? Right. Yeah. Yeah, and just knowing. Henry, knowing who he was and when he entered the conservatoire and what these conservatoire pieces were intended for, you know, for their final annual exam. Yeah. And I think that's important because, you know, what are we examining? It's what have you practiced all year and what, what can you now do? Yep. So that's, I think that's why there's a lot of crescendo diminuendos. Those are hard. Uh, (laughs) So do the diminuendo, you know, and, uh, playing soft, that's Mm -hmm. hard. So, um, I think that's a that's something that we can you know make sure to bring out and not not miss. It's there these pieces are really not just about the notes at all. You right. know, they're they're really about um control over the instrument. So mm-hmm. yeah. The virtuosity of it. I mean, even in the prelude, you know, you have all these flourishes and not seeing it for I mean, it's scalic, it's a scalar passage for sure, but it's just that flourish. It's a gesture. Yeah. You know. And uh, feeling it like a gesture feels completely different than one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, et cetera, because it's not. I mean, it's it's a flourish. And so. Yeah. Um, but at that same time, I yeah. would really well, yes. caution you <laughs> to play the correct note of, values because yes. you, you also hear this yeah. a lot where, um, you know, say like the odd tempo, the three, four, mm-hmm. there's no measure numbers. Um, you know, we have 16th notes to 32nd notes. Then there's a sextuplet in the next bar and then there's more 32nd notes. And actually if you play them exact in rhythm, um, it really changes how the piece lays out. And mm-hmm. a lot of the times with my students or, you know, mm-hmm. students that I work with, they don't understand those note values. And, mm. uh, and then it's really hard because yeah. actually you can rush through these things and they're really tough. Like these nine tuplets later on. Mm-hmm. Um, if you just play them in what would be the actual tempo, it would just be da 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 It's not very fast. No, it's not. But if you look at those and you're like, whoa, that's nine notes in one beat, then you can really freak out or the, you know, the 10 later on. If you think of it, you know, instead in groups of two and fit it in to one beat, it's, you know, it's going to be much easier. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Gesturally flourish for sure. Yeah. As far as learning it, you know, make sure that they're, you learn them correctly rhythmically so yes. that you're not rushing. And then uh, sometimes you get ahead of yourself and then, then it makes mm-hmm. it harder. So I, I find that a lot, you know, with learning music, it's always better to just learn, you know, especially big runs, learn them, you know, in note groupings yes. and learn them in uh, small little chunks and then put it all together, you know? Uh, yeah. And, and then uh, most of the time they're not hard. So one of my professors, Dr. Sarah McCoy would say, those are real notes in real time. Like yeah. those are definitely, you know, the nine uplets, you know, or the 10 uplets. They're specifically written there by Henry. And, you know, it, he had a very specific purpose with that. And we don't want to disregard and have like a note in the middle get smeared because there's supposed to be nine or 10. Or- well, and the other thing about that is 
if you can play them in the correct speed, if you play them at the correct speed, then you're actually taking care of each note. And yeah, it's great that you played all the notes and you know that'll get you some points. But then on top of that, if you rush through them and you don't quite get all of them, then your sound goes out also. Sure. So that's something that I've always found is if I can play all the notes really consistently, then when I get to a long note, my sound is still working. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I kind of chip some notes in, in the middle of the fast stuff, then when I get to a long note, my sound doesn't work anymore, you know, because yeah. I've, I've let the tone go during a fast passage, which sure. you hear a lot where somebody's, you know, blah, 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 and they have to land on a big note. And it's like, by the time they get there, they're not really playing the flute as well as when they started. I see. You know, so the, the air is not going in the right place anymore. So right. you can really, uh, you can actually like kill two birds you know, hurts the flute players uh, <laughs> with, with yeah. one stone here by by really making sure that you, you know, keep your sound through these notes by just playing them in rhythm and, you know, really mm -hmm. paying attention to every, you know, every note. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that always helps me. For sure. Know. So anything you would like to say about the scherzo? The scherzo, you know, light, playful, mm -hmm. short note values. The eighth notes shouldn't be too long. They don't have to be like insanely staccato, I, yeah. but... Uh, but, you know, just everything should be light. The accents, I think, uh, you know, that's something that can get overlooked. We mm. have these little accents on the third beat a lot, on the you know dotted quarter notes. So when you get to your mezzo, I think, you know, the tendency is we have like a crescendo all the way to a quarter note with a mezzo forte, and we're going to play that one the loudest. But you know that the third beat has an accent. So maybe play underplay the the crescendo a little bit and save something for the accent. These little kind of, they're kind of sometimes humorous, you know, little <laughs> offbeat accents, you know, they, they can bring a lot of spark to the piece and, you know, kind of, again, like I was saying earlier, you, you know, bring a personal touch to the piece without actually doing anything personal because you're actually just doing what's on the page. Mm. But, um, but a lot of people will miss those things um, in their preparation. So I would definitely say, you know, look for all those details, try to be, the person who gets every detail on the page mm. in there. And we have this slower section, I guess, later on, uh, the three, four, where it slows down, but it stays rhythmically equivalent. You know, there I would really make sure with the vibrato, again, that I'm really blowing through all the notes. You know, so B flat, F, G, especially on the eighth notes, you know, don't, don't take the vibrato completely out of your eighth notes, you know, really lead through it. It's Dolce Espressivo. To me, that doesn't mean non-vibrato, mm -hmm. you know, but we've just been playing a lot of fast stuff and, you know, maybe the tone isn't where you want it. So that, that, that mm -hmm. could be something that, uh, yeah, I would look at and going forward, you know, 16th notes, you just mm -hmm. play them well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't be scared to have fun. You know, this is all happy, mm -hmm. fun music in a lot of, in a lot of these places. The three, four melody comes back, you know, the. I think overall, if you can keep it kind of snappy and uh, don't get bogged down when it gets slower, because technically the note values, you know, the dotted quarter becomes the quarter. So it right. should just stay the same. It just the music itself is slower, but uh, but the, the pulse should yes. remain, which I think is really important too. sometimes if we take too much liberty with the changing the pulse, it actually makes the piece worse instead of better. We're trying to make, you know, our own. Then we have this little cadenza. Yeah. Uh, the ad lib section. Yes. Uh, I would, you know, that's not the most <laughs> cadential cadenza of all right. time. But, uh, you know, really kind of like pace it out. So, mm -hmm. poco a poco a chel. Make sure you don't start too fast. You yeah. Know, don't, don't get ahead of yourself before you get to the vivo. Otherwise, it's just going to be too hard. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of playing fast stuff a little slower so that it's cleaner and more, um, mm. it's not even necessarily that it's clean. It actually sounds faster if you're accurate and slow, I think, oh, um, interesting. you know, if, if you can really play every note, it's going to sound more virtuosic than if you're stumbling, trying to play too fast, you sure. know? So, you know, obviously you don't want to be way under playing the tempos, but if I'm playing, you know, a fast piece, I'm always going to do a tempo that I can really handle instead of playing like really on the edge where I might fall apart because I'd rather play, you know, with a lot of these things, it's like, um, it's kind of like a multi-perpetual effect where, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like uh, 
a violin would just, you know, play nonstop for you know, 10 pages without stopping the bow stroke. And, you know, these, this is kind of a similar thing where we have these triplets and, uh, the idea is there's a lot of notes in a short period of time. So mm-hmm. if, if we start fumbling some of those notes, then that, that effect doesn't come across. So I actually think if we can get the stream of notes to be consistent, it's actually more, more effective. Um, My takeaway with that is that's excellent. My takeaway is uh, studying with Lisa Garner Santa when we would get faster and faster and she'd say, move those fingers, move those fingers. She would say, you know, like in her brain when she's playing fast, it's like the matrix. Everything slows down. Mm -hmm. So even though you're going fast, you're still thinking slow to be, to have that accuracy. I don't know if that analogy helps anybody, but that that matrix-like motion and uh, mentality really helped me. For so the kids I think out there, The Matrix was a movie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 90s, yeah. and I'm telling my it's, age right now. It's, it's crazy that The Matrix is now like kind of an older movie. Yeah. I, I When I was younger, it was like the coolest thing to ever come out. But, and yeah. when you say 90s, I think 10 years ago. <laughs> and they tell me that that was like 30 years ago. And I'm like, what? It's getting there. 90s was yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think, you know, definitely you don't want to get ahead of yourself. You know, when I think that that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I practice fast stuff very slow, like mm-hmm. in extra slow motion. So slower than you could possibly imagine would be effective. And the reason why I think it is effective is that I can work on my sound on those notes then, yeah. you know, so I'm always having a good sound through all my notes. Um, and then when I play really fast, my air knows where to go. Whereas if I just always play like fast and then slightly less fast, I feel like you don't actually learn, you don't train yourself where the the air has to go. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's something that I would do with all of this is, you know, play it not half tempo, but like half of half tempo mm-hmm. and like really painfully slow and focus yeah. on tone and try yeah. to make a really good tone through this. Um, oh, and that was the other thing. I mean, the rest of it, I think is kind of, you know, a breeze to the end. Sure. Um, for this competition, I mean, you're, you're trying to play in a flute choir. So I would think that whoever's listening to it probably wants us, hmm. people who are going to make a sound that will work in the context of that. So maybe you would approach it trying to make a homogenous sound, which I would probably be trying to make anyway. <laughs> but, uh, right. but you know, you don't want to make a really buzzy, crazy, loud sound all the time because that's going to stick out in a flute choir. Um, you know, and the same thing goes for like an orchestra audition or, you know, a festival audition or anything that you're doing an ensemble. Um, you know, always remember that people are picking you to play with other people. They're not picking you just to, you know, play a concerto. So make sure that your tone is pleasant, you know, mm-hmm. I, all the time. And, you know, that, that you're not showing, you know, the tone going in and out. Cause that can be really hard to tune with and blend with and stuff like that. So, so I try to really keep that in mind as well as that, you know, if this is for a flute choir competition, uh, you know, I want to make a sound that I think will blend with other flutes, not yeah. just, Oh, listen to me. I'm, I can play really loud. And, you know, so, you know, keep in mind that this is maybe a different kind of competition, not just, uh, for winning best flutist of, the, the day or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like that. Just even considering what is this for and the listeners of this NFA competition, it's for the purpose of playing with the flute choir. So, I mean, uh, what your comment <clears throat> makes perfect sense. I really like that suggestion for sure. Great. So let's go to the third piece. And this is Valerie Coleman's Butterfly Dance. I am not a Spanish speaker. So saying this in Espanol is not my forte. I studied French in college, not Spanish. So saying butterfly dance, I hope is okay. <laughs> well, I'm just going to call it the Coleman. Okay. Uh, but uh, no, this is Don't, it's a very cool piece. I actually didn't know this piece at all until a couple of days ago when you sent it to me to, yeah. you know, look over this competition music. And it's very cool. I enjoyed learning it. I think she really writes very well for the flute, which mm. I understand she's a flute player. So now yes. that makes more sense. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I really, I like this a lot. I think that uh, it's kind of, you know, in the same vein of the Telemon, we can mm. really remember that we are the show here. And this is, you know, kind of our, our chance to show all of our range mm-hmm. and, you know, what, what we can do with the flute. So you know, right from the beginning, 
you know, we have this da 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 kind of figure. And uh, I would make sure that you don't rush those first two notes and not because of any rhythmic reason that because you haven't played any notes. So nobody knows if they're rushed or not. But mm -hmm. what I mean is make clear, well-formed notes because this is the first thing that anybody hears. Yeah. So, you know, if you make a really nice first couple of notes, uh, you can you kind of set the tone for what else is going to come. So if you rush through those and kind of, you know, they don't come out perfectly, then your D, sh D flat's probably not going to be as nice anyway. And, and then, uh, you know, it kind of sets the wrong tone. So I really almost stylize those. Mm. Um, so they, it, it sets up a, a certain vibe right from the beginning. And really I would, I would dig into this D flat, uh, oh, yeah. you know, really, you know, we got Forte, we're right in the beginning, you know, really give it a nice ringing, uh, beautiful tone mm. right from the beginning. No, no I wouldn't mm. go too new music-y with it, you know, or non-vibrato or whatever. Uh, I would really, you know, kind of think like uh, your trumpet tone or something, something really resonant yeah. and, and uh, big. Uh, I agree. It kind of has this fanfare opening. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So with that trumpet um, sound in mind, that coincides with the fanfare-esque um, sound mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. And like the Talman, I love how you just point out that, yes, they are both unaccompanied pieces. Later with the singing and playing, you are accompanying yourself with your voice. So singing, probably just practicing singing that pitch uh, with the drone. Yeah, I mean, good luck on that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sing any octave. <laughs> that's that's not really my specialty, honestly. I would, yeah. you know, I, I've tried it. Never sounds particularly good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And honestly, I, I generally avoid stuff that includes it. But, you know, it's for a competition. So you have to be able to do what they want you to do. So, yeah, uh, so yeah practice it with a drone, practice it, you know, with your tuner, whatever. Um, I think overall it's an effect. So mm -hmm. maybe if you, uh, we start on a C sharp, right, when it comes in and, you know, the flute's playing a C sharp. So just try to sing the note that you're playing and then, and then go up from there. And if your C sharp modulates a little bit. <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know that I would even notice, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, even like people who are really good at that stuff, it, it's generally more of like a buzzy kind of sound than a, than a beautiful bel canto. Yeah. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I will say, though, that the more I have been practicing this to prepare for today, just singing and playing, I've noticed my tone open up. So I was kind of singing and playing even on scales or long tones. And I just noticed that there was definitely... Uh, more of a resonance in my sound. So if it's something for you listeners, especially maybe even the, the younger listeners, if it's not your forte, I think just even trying to incorporate it in warm-ups, you might be pleasantly surprised with the, the results. Yeah. And I, I mean, I've done singing and playing exercises as tone exercises mm -hmm. in the past. And I do think they're really helpful. The one thing I would caution everybody about is actually sometimes people get really tight trying to sing. Sure. So, yes. so then yes. it does the opposite. So I've actually seen <laughs> people do that where they're singing and their throat is really tight because they're trying to make a tone with their voice and their flute. And then it makes everything worse. So, the, mm. you know, as long as you understand the point of singing and playing is be open as possible. So yep. you can make the ugliest singing tone in the world <laughs> as long as it's open. You know, you could be screaming into the flute. I don't <laughs> care. But it's just the idea is to have a very open, resonant thing. So, um you know, I've noticed, I've had like some students where I ask, you know, what do you do for warm ups? And, you know, oh, I do singing and playing. And then I, I'm like, can I hear it? And then I listen. And I'm like, well, oh. that's making everything worse. <laughs> you know? So make sure you understand the goal of the exercise, which is, you know, let's, let's have a very uh, open throat, a very open chest. You know, the ribs are open. Um, and actually, uh, I won't name this flute player, but a very like well known flute player who is amazing. She told me that she likes to start her day. I don't know if she wanted this to be public, so that's why I won't name her. <laughs> well, it's not offensive was, yeah. or anything. But uh, <laughs> she told me that she likes to start her day by singing and playing because you can't possibly make a worse sound the rest of the day. Oh, so, okay. so you get the, all the self judgment out of the way because you just you start, you know, you sing and play, and you you know kind of blast it out there, and then after that, it's like, wow, I sound good, you know. So, <laughs> so, and I actually kind of like that where. Uh, you know, if you're doing something, an exercise where it's not really about what tone you're making on the flute or in your voice, mm. use it as an exercise. Don't use it to make a, you know, a beautiful tone on the flute. I think then that's where yeah. some people get tense because then they're like, oh, well, my tone is bad now. It's like, well, 
yeah, you're just doing a o- opening freeing kind of exercise. Uh, you're not trying to make the same tone that you would necessarily make if you're playing the Bousset. You know? Ex- <laughs> so, exactly. Yeah. Yes. And speaking of other extended techniques that are in this piece, um, there's a lot of flutter tonguing, which yeah. I think most of us can do fairly well in the middle to the upper register. But Valerie has flutter tonguing in the low register. She has it on a low D, I see mm-hmm. here, um, in 79, 80. And so for me, I can, for some weird reason, I can flutter tongue in the low register. But I heard at a master class one time that some people have to switch over to like a throat gurgling. Yeah, right. Yeah, the like the cat purr yes. thing. Yeah. <laughs> I can't do that. Can I tried out? so hard. Okay. Uh, so you can flutter tongue in the in the lower register then. Yeah, and okay. I would say if you can't, the reason is tension. Okay. So usually, you know, your lips are getting tight, your throat's getting tight, uh, your jaw's getting tight. Uh, so you're trying to roll your R, you know. Yeah. So you're thinking about that. So when I need to flutter tongue low, and we've like done pieces in the orchestra where you have to flutter tongue on a B, you know, mm. and it's what I try to do is make my airstream really relaxed and really low. So I'm mm-hmm. like really opening up like big O vowel um, and and I just try to drop the air in with the flutter effect. So uh, don't try to pressurize the air. You know, sometimes when we do the flutter, it it actually blows the air really fast. So flutter tongues, A, are always sharp. So mm-hmm. you should aim them down anyway because, the I mean, probably nobody cares. But, you know, <laughs> just for a personal goal, yeah. I like to play my flutter tongues closer to being in tune. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, always aim them down anyway. But then in the low register, particularly, you know, you don't cover the head joint because that'll have the opposite effect, uh, then, then less air will get in anyway, but, right. uh, you know, really try to drop the jaw and mm. let the air go downward mm. and not, not too fast. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. And the other thing that I was just thinking, just, you know, butterfly dance. I don't know if you know this, you've been in the Texas area for three years now, but there's a butterfly house in Dallas. Hmm. Yeah. So if in your local city, um, town if there's a butterfly house maybe go to it i mean you can walk into it the one in dallas and um some of the butterflies are still in their cocoons um and you can get if it's a rare opportunity it's breaking through the cocoon you can watch it you know explode which is a really neat experience but um i don't know something on the more creative side since you're talking about telemon and showing you know creativity and things like that the same applies here for sure um and if you wanted to get your I don't know, creativity juju on, maybe go to a butterfly house and see butterflies dance around you. So maybe there'll be some inspiration. I think there's, you know, like there's never, you know, when doing a competition, I think the first thing that we forget is that we we're artists and that we're mm-hmm. playing music, you know, mm-hmm. and everybody's trying to play the notes and all that wonderful stuff, which we have to do. But yeah, why not go see some butterflies? They're pretty, like you know, or you know, go take a walk outside. You know, like a, an hour off of practicing is really not going to kill you. Uh, yeah. So I think you know, look, looking at art, you know, like I was talking about before, listening to other music of that style, uh, listen to Valerie play. Why not? You know, yeah. I, I'm going to, you yeah. know, because I learned her piece and now I'm curious. So mm-hmm. why not, you know, listen to what she sounds like? Maybe that will give you some cues. Uh, you know, listen to recordings of you know, violin players playing stuff with butterflies in the title or whatever, you know, just, you know, I I think it's always best to stay in a creative mindset and try to remember why we're doing this. Not Mm -hmm. that, oh, I need to, you know, make sure my singing and playing is perfectly in tune. (laughs) Uh, And, uh, you know, you really want to have, I think in the end, what is going to win or lose the competitions will be that, you know, personal sense of, style and flair or whatever you bring to it because you know if everybody could play just the exact same version and win then everybody would so uh yeah i think you know always try to stay inspired stay obviously you want to be practicing your flute but uh you know don't don't just live in a practice room and then miss out on you know everything else around you i think then then you're actually missing half the point anyway so yeah go see some butterflies why not (laughs) I think that comment um, and suggestion of living life and going out, I think that's a beautiful way to wrap up this episode. And on that note, could you tell the listeners about your summer festival this summer where you teach? 
Yeah, so I, every summer I teach at uh, Eastern Music Festival in North Carolina. It's in Greensboro. I was actually a student there mm -hmm. uh, when I was uh, after my freshman year of college. Um, and my first year of teaching there, uh, I was playing in the Philadelphia Orchestra and the assistant principal there, he was retiring. Uh, his name was David Kramer, amazing flute player. And um, he's like, oh, what are you doing this summer? And I was like, oh, I just started this. I'm going to start teaching at Eastern Music Festival. And he was like, I'm an alum from there, you know, and he was, you know, retiring. So I don't know, sixties or something. And so I, I thought that was pretty crazy. And then actually our principal violist in this orchestra, she was an alumni. So it's this festival has been around for a long time, you know, a lot of really distinguished graduates. But what I think is so cool about it is, well, first of all, the flute faculty is really fantastic. Uh, to me, not that I'm fantastic, but the other fa flute faculty are fantastic. Uh, and then Anne Chumack, who's the uh, piccolo player in the St. Louis Symphony, and Les Rutkus, who's the principal flute in Jacksonville Symphony. And there's nine flute students, so we each have three uh, full-time, and then we open up our studios so people can kind of just take lessons with us whenever. So it's a lot of individual instruction. And then there's two student orchestras, so everybody's in orchestra every week. Uh, they all play in chamber groups. It's a pretty professional, intense experience as a student. This this summer, the student orchestra is doing Daphnis, so somebody will get to play that, and you know, and then sometimes they get to sit in with us in the festival orchestra as well, depending on you know if somebody's out that week or if we have extra need extra flutes. Sometimes uh, they'll double it. And Gerard Schwartz is the conductor, and he was the conductor of Seattle Symphony for music director of Seattle Symphony for like thirty years, and. There's a street named after him in Seattle and stuff. He's like, he, kind of, he created, you know, built Seattle Symphony into what it is now. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a great festival. I went there myself. I've sent many students there before I was teaching. And uh, um, yeah, I think it's a cool opportunity to get, you know, a lot of kind of professional level experience. Oh, and there's an age limit. Okay. This is what I actually forgot about because I was recommending it to students. Um, but I think it's like 24 and under. Okay. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, I went there that th I did that festival. I did Aspen and I kind of, I went there like when I was a little bit, you know, on the young side for getting into the flute studio at Aspen. So, and the, this, uh, experience is pretty similar to like a big orchestral festival like Aspen where, you know, you're kind of treated more like a pro you're expected to, you know, the rehearsals, maybe there's like four rehearsals per cycle and then mm. you play a concert. So it's mm. more of a professional schedule than like maybe in a school situation where you might work on, you know, Chike 6 for half a semester. You know, this is like you have Wednesday and you perform it on Friday, you know. Perfect. So so yeah. it's really for people who want that experience, maybe with less of a stress level because it's not, you know, Tanglewood or something where maybe that could be more stressful. You know, so it's, it's a good place to go you know, kind of starting out. I went when I was a freshman in college. Most of the kids are around that age, but we've had seniors who fit in the age limit. And uh, and then every once in a while, we'll have like a, you know, uh, older high school. There's also high school division. So anybody's eligible just based on the audition. So great. I recommend it. I, I like doing it. It's fun. Yeah. yeah. And I'll put a link out so the listeners can apply to that. Um, and it's always great to Think of summer programs in advance and start planning because... Yeah, I think actually the application deadline is relatively soon. Okay. It's later than most festivals, but I think it's relatively soon. No, the okay. other thing, uh, I haven't actually put this out yet, but I've been working on a video series um, on my YouTube channel. So just Jake Fritkis, my name, F-R-I-D-K-I-S, with just free advice, uh, just free... I I've been... I, I've been getting so sick of going over daily routine stuff with all my students, yeah. you know, over and over again that I decided to just record going through a daily routine and kind of how I would approach that. So, mm -hmm. um, so I just thought like, just put out some, you know, fundamental ideas. So I'm, you know, I just did a Taffanel Gobert one. So like what to practice in Taffanel Gobert, how to practice it, how I practice it. And then, you know, with plenty of examples of myself playing it as well. And just kind of the idea of being like, put some free information out there. Yeah. And then, you know, when my students ask me, I can say, just go watch the video. So we don't have to waste <laughs> 20 minutes of your lesson. Um, Cause I do think like with exercises, like we talked about a little bit with this, uh, you know, if you practice them in an effective way, they're so much better. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, same with pieces. So yeah, I was starting with exercises and I'll probably go over some pieces and, you know, some, I plan to do, you know, 
some of the hard runs in like Chantelinos or something like that. Like, how would you learn those? Because when you look at them, they're so overwhelming. Yes. And I remember, you know, wasting so much time of my own. Mm -hmm. So I thought, you know, I'll just make video, you know, a couple videos about it. So uh, hopefully people will learn. So you can check that out on my YouTube. Hopefully it'll be up soon. I just have to figure out how to video edit. Okay. (laughs) Well, thank you so much. And I just so appreciate our time. And I love just the energy you have and just the kind heart that you have. And I just wish you all the best. And I'm so glad that the flute community, especially in Fort Worth, has you um, at our disposal. And I actually need to come and hear you at a concert. (laughs) It's not my fault. I can't, I left Fort Worth when he, when Jake came in and then um, now I'm back in the area. So now I'm looking forward to hearing you and your brother. I think next, next year we're doing Brahms four for the opening concert. Okay. I forget, honestly, we're doing Brahms two like next week, I think. Okay. There's always good stuff. Yeah. We, we do a lot of good stuff. We just did Daphnis. That was pretty fun. Oh, yeah. Um, and Pam's a good friend of mine. Yeah, I love yeah. Pam. We're really lucky. Well, I, I'm lucky to have her in this section. Uh, you know, she was a, here when I got here already. Obviously. She's a beautiful person. Just yeah. Just, very kind. No, we're lucky. The whole orchestra overall is just a very kind, welcoming group of people. So especially as a younger player coming in, it was a uh, pretty special group to join you know i I Mm. you know sometimes you hear horror stories of people right being stressed out all the time and you know i was stressed out for plenty of reasons but you know never for dealing with my colleagues you know being you know unprofessional or cruel or anything like that everybody's always actually very supportive and you know why are you practicing so much it's fine it sounds good (laughs) so yeah we we have a good vibe and it's it's a fun group oh that's so i I feel very lucky to be here excellent great Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Today's episode is sponsored by J&K Productions. They produce all of my episodes from adding the intro and outro music to editing the audio and all post-production needs. Contact them for your next podcast project at jkproductions.media. Thank you for listening to the Flute 360 podcast. For more information, please visit HeidiKBegay.com. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please rate and review in the iTunes store. Let's talk about flute.